And before we go into the word of God, whatever God is going to say today, let's lift our hands in worship. Hallelujah. 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 Honor him. Adore him. Exalt him. Hallelujah. And let the words of my mouth, our mouths, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, give your neighbor God bless you and you may be seated in the sanctuary. And for everybody who can, grab your neighbor by the hand if you can say it in sincerity and truth and say, my soul says yes. As you turn with me to Matthew 14. Mm. Matthew 14. Verse. 25 <laughs> In Matthew 14, 25, the word of the Lord reads in one verse, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. If you turn back with me, please. To Exodus chapter 38, as we return to the teaching on the tabernacle, coming off of our 
Women's Seminar. The word of the Lord reads in verse 8. Moreover, he made the labor of the bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Father, we do bless you. We honor you. We seek your face. I personally lift you up and yield this mind, this tongue, as stammering as it may be, to your control. Let these words, Father, be your words. These thoughts, your thoughts. Someone here today, God, needs a word. So we wait for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you just for being who you are. We bless you out of Zion and expect a word from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. God. So be it. It It is done. Precious ones, the only reason why I added, and I believe the Lord somehow is going to connect Exodus 38 to Matthew 14, just those two verses for the sake of somebody in the house today. For the benefit of you, my sisters, my daughters, and my mothers who were not here yesterday, we talked about Penina and Hannah. I find it awesome and awesome in God that Elder Sandy Harris, all the way down in Texas. Elder and Dr. Felicia Green in Richmond, Virginia. As well as myself here in Cleveland. All came out of the same scripture. We had not collaborated. We had not discussed it. We had not talked about it. But I believe God was talking to someone in Mount Zion. And I'm encouraging you to read the story of Hannah and Penina. If you all can give me about a half hour this morning. I have been in this thing as far as the preaching ministry and the teaching ministry now for over 32 years. I have been around ministers and ministries and bishops and presiding elders just about all of my life. And there's one thing I have learned is that unless a person wants Jesus... They cannot be force-fed the word. Yesterday we talked about and discovered the difference between the two wives of Elkanah, Penina and Hannah. We saw in the scripture that the thing that is Penina in our lives needs to be put away. Yesterday, in my exuberance, I said, kill Penina, but I've been in this thing too long not to know that things that are a part of us don't die. 
they have to be dealt with. And one of the problems and one of the challenges with people in church, and because this is our women's weekend, I've, I've been concentrating on the women, whether they get an attitude or angry or not. But I have found that in church settings, it's usually the women that stir up the most mess. Either the women or the sissies will stir up the most mess. And when I say sissies, I'm not talking about homosexual men. I'm talking about men that want to be women. If we go back, just stay with me for a moment. If we go back even to Adam and Eve, it was to Eve that the serpent came and Eve got next to Adam. If we look as Miller was telling me, at the insect world, it is not the male mosquito that bites you, it's the female. If we look at the animal kingdom, it is the female that does the killing, not the male. You see, that spirit was loosed in the garden. And unless a woman brings that spirit under the lordship of Jesus Christ... That spirit will ruin your family, it will ruin your children, and it's amazing to me how much so many of us, men and women, are in denial about us. Like Penina talked about Hannah, but you don't read of her saying anything about herself. And the church is full of people like that. There's Penina in all of our lives. I know what and who my Penina is. And sometimes I can deal with it, and sometimes I can't. But I have to remember that there has been an antagonistic spirit sent in my direction, and usually that spirit is in your church or your family or your friends. I've come to tell you today that the church is filled with people, and right now I'm taking the gender out of it. The church is filled with people who operate under the spirit of Penina. And on the other hand, God and the pastor is looking for the spirit of Hannah. Hannah had her own issues as we went over yesterday, but the difference between Hannah and Penina is that Hannah talked to God about it. Yeah. Hannah did not project and expect somebody else to pay her bills. Yeah. Hannah did not show forth attitude. Hannah was quiet. She was burdened, but she was quiet. All of us in here have something that's sitting on the top of our heads. But the scripture gave us another four things about Hannah. The four I talked about, and the other towns had four more, but the four I talked about was number one, Hannah prayed. Number two, and listen to me carefully, because this is where we're going in this series. She got a word from the prophet. Not that she got a word straight from the Lord. She got a word from the priest of the house. And unlike so many women and men I know, when she got the word, she didn't put up any argument. Just like when Mary got the word from whatever angel came to her, Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. And then Hannah acted upon the word. You can't just take a word and shout about it without acting on it. Faith without works is dead. And then Hannah got her miracle. But the thing about Hannah is that when she got her miracle, she gave it back. I believe upon further research of the scripture that there was a reason why Hannah was so burdened by not having a child. Mm. I need a church here. She had been burdened and crying because her womb 
The scripture says, had been closed. But I don't know if you've ever been to the airport and you looked up at the arrivals and departures. And sometimes it says, delayed. It's on the way, but it's just not going to get there on your timetable. I don't want to get too far off, but it's just like the prophet said when he said they, that wait. I heard somebody preaching. Give me 35 minutes. I heard somebody preaching this morning and I got so angry and so vexed in my spirit because they were so off and the people were shouting all over the place. They were talking about they that wait on the Lord and how they defined waiting though they had a preacher's voice and though they knew the right words to say they were ignorant in their definition of the biblical word kaka, wait. He wasn't talking about sitting down doing nothing but the Hebrew word that is used there is a word that is used in restaurants waiting on a table and what the prophet was saying is they that wait on the Lord not sit down but serve him while you're waiting for your breakthrough They that can continue running, continue dancing, continue giving, continue lifting him up instead of coming in the sanctuary or going home with your head down all the time. There's always something wrong with you. And all of us have issues. You see where we mess up is that we think we're the only ones going through. Just because somebody else is not crying does not mean they're not going through. It just means they're going through in a different way. They're keeping busy by waiting on the Lord, if you understand what I'm saying. By serving God's table, okay, God, here's some praise, here's some worship, here's some glory. I'm going to lift you up. I've been with you long enough to know what you like. I don't have to wait for you to order it. I'll have it at your table when you get there, Lord, because I know you're just that well. No, no. Waiting on God is different than than just sitting down. I didn't got off here. But the reason why Hannah was so burdened It's because the scripture doesn't say this, but I know it in my sanctified soul and my sanctified imagination. I know it from a sanctified exegesis. You got to understand the reason why she was so burdened is because somewhere in her spirit, God had already dropped that she was going to have a baby. You see, if God hadn't dropped it, she wouldn't have been so burdened. She would have forgotten about it and just been content with Elkanah as her husband. But when God has dropped something in your spirit, you may not know what it is or when it's coming. But there's something intrinsic to the nature of man. Where when man knows something is coming, we don't want to wait for the timing. We want it right now. And we say, God said right now. It's just like back in the early spring. Hallelujah. Give me 40 minutes now. I'm almost done. Just like back in the early spring. There are some cherry trees around my house. And mama, when the weather was still cold, there was a warm day. And on that warm day, the cherry blossoms came out. But then the next day was a cold snap. And they fell off. Because they came out too early. 
But then when the weather warmed back up, they came out again. And this time they stayed until they produced fruit. Mm. That's what happens to some of us. We get a warm spell and think that it's time to blossom. But when the storm and the rain comes, the blossoms fall off because we haven't spent enough time in God or with God to know how to hold on to the blossom when they come out. When God has spoken something to you, baby, you got to hold on even when it looks like everything is going to go under. You got to learn how to stand. I heard somebody tell me, I failed every test, Pastor. I failed every test. I don't, baby, get up and go back to school. Take the classes over again. Maybe you were premature. Maybe you were premature when you bought that Mercedes. Maybe you were premature when you got that high mortgage. Maybe you were premature when you married the wrong woman or the wrong man. Maybe you were premature, but when God is ready to bless you and to favor you, I remember the scripture saying the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And without repentance, y'all bear with me just a little while longer. And so as we apply the dynamics of Hannah and Penina to the serving women, mm, ah, hallelujah, at the tabernacle, we see that these were women who did not mind doing whatever they could for the Lord, for Moses, and for the tabernacle. And the Hebrew word that is employed for serving here is Shabbat. Shabbat. Ah, Shabbat. I find it interesting that Moses used the word Shabbat here in the Pentateuch when he was writing Exodus. Because what it means, it is an elementary and a principle and a primitive root for the word army. And it means in this order, to assemble, to wait for instruction, to perform the duty, and to go to war. Oh, my sisters and my brothers, that's one of the issues among us. We will assemble. That's all we'll do. We won't wait for instruction. And when the instruction comes, we don't want to take it. But baby, I've come to tell you that if you're going to be a servant woman or a servant man, you better learn how to fight. And I'm not talking about fighting your mama or fighting your husband, or fighting your wife, or fighting the church, or fighting the pastor, you better learn how to fight the devil. And I'm not talking about the devil in your mama, or the devil in the church, or the devil in your husband. I'm talking about the devil in you. Talk to me somebody. I'm reminded of another story, y'all stay with me a little while, of a man that, that bought home a boxing bag for his son. And the boxing bag had Mike Tyson's face on it. And every time it was constructed in such a way that every time the little boy would hit it, he would go down and bounce back up. Little boy kept on hitting it, it kept going down. Bouncing back up. Finally, little boy said, Daddy, why don't this thing stay down? Father came up and the father hit it. Hey, Tabasha. It went down, but it came back up. Then the father got down on the floor and looked at it and kicked it. It went down, but it came back up. So then the father took his foot and put on it. And it stayed down. I've come to tell you, fighting women, if you don't want the devil to pop back up, keep your feet on him. 
The only place he belongs is under your feet. That's why some of us shout. That's why some of us dance. That's why some of us stomp. Because we're stomping the devil back down to where he belongs. And that hell, you got to get out of my life, Satan. Is there anybody, anybody that can shake your neighbor's hand and say, I'm going to stomp the devil back down? That's the problem. See, it's not enough praise in the church. It's not enough hollering in the church. I don't know how folk just come every week and watch everybody else when God's got a victory for you. Wait a minute. It's amazing to me how some of y'all have been around here for over 20 years and still don't have a consistent praise. Wait a minute. You're always talking about your back hurt, your feet hurt, your butt hurt. Well, maybe if you worked it out a little bit, it wouldn't hurt so much. Let everything, I, I, I said let everything that has breath. Praise him. Help me somebody. Touch three people and say praise him. Learn how to do warfare. War for your family. War for your children. War for your money. War for your health. Every time you get a headache, that ain't the time to start crying. That's the time to get up and start fighting. I'm going to do everything I know how to do. And if nothing I do works, then I'm going to call on the name Jesus. Because my victory may be in the name. Matter of fact, can you touch three people and say, my victory may be in the name. In the name. I'm talking to the serving women. Let me see. I'm talking to the serving women. That means the warring women. I'm talking to y'all that's so mad at the devil that you want to kick his butt. I'm talking to y'all that's so mad with your circumstances that you're ready to change them. I'm talking to y'all that's tired of going through and you're ready to come out. Look at somebody and say, stand on the devil. Hey. Hey, hey, hallelujah. Now, so now we got the serving women. Help me, God. Now, let me tell you something. Mm. I'm almost done. I'm getting ready to try to tie it in now. Touch your neighbor and say, it's not too late to start fighting back. It's not your mother. <laughs> it's not your father. It's not your wife or your husband. It's not even the bank. It's not the mortgage company. No, but it's time for you to start fighting back. That's if you are serving woman. I'm taking the gender out of it right now. I want all the serving women. I've taken the gender out of it. I'm gonna say serving women and serving men. I want you to serve notice on the kingdom of darkness right now that you ain't taking it no more. That you're getting ready to fight back. I want a war cry in Zion. I want a war cry in Zion. I want the devil to know that you coming after him with everything you got. You coming after him with the blood. You're coming after him with the word. You're coming after him with the anointing. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Ah, now touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't forget what you just did. I didn't hear nobody say, neighbor, don't forget what you just did. I'm getting ready to tie it in now. 
serving women. <laughs> I'm getting ready to tie it in. I need you to understand that Moses only took the mirrors or the looking glasses from the serving women. He didn't take it from any of the other women, just the warring women. Why is that? Why is that so significant? Well, it's because the looking glass was one of a woman's most precious objects back in that day because they were so rare. That was one of the things that they had plundered from Egypt, the looking glass, so that they could look at themselves. But Moses said, if you're going to be a serving woman, you got to give me your looking glass because if you're always looking at yourself, you'll never look at Jesus. If you're always looking at your situation, if you're always looking at your circumstance, you will never look at Jesus. So give me your looking glass. Give me your mirror so I can create a labor. I don't want to go into the labor right now, but I'm going to touch on it right now. There is something about the labor that you need to understand before they could get into the inner court. They had to go by the labor that was made from the looking glasses of the serving women. They had to go by the labor which was filled with water and they had to look in the labor not to see how good they looked but rather to see how dirty they were and they would have to take the water and wash off themselves before they went into the inner court. How are you going to approach a holy God if there's no holiness about you? How are you going to approach a holy God if there's no holiness about you? How are you going to approach a sanctified God if you're not sanctified? How are you going to approach a blessed God 